Welcome back. Now we're going to look at the individual drying methods. So for each method, we're going to split them up into what is the method and how does it work, part one, and then what sort of materials can we dry with the method and why, part two. After each drying method, I'm going to create a table and that table is just going to summarize briefly the types of materials that can be dried with each of those methods. I hope you remember from the start, I said, one of the common ways that I set an exam question is to give you a series of materials and ask you to work out what's the best drying method and why. So if that type of question comes up, it is kind of key that when you answer that question, you justify your answer. OK, so you need to pick the right um, method of drying in the first place, but you also need to justify why you've chosen that method. It's not really sufficient just to say, I'm going to use spray drying for that material, sir, and I'm not going to tell you why. It's in my head. That doesn't help for the marks, does it? Because I don't know what you're thinking. So in an exam type situation, always write down what you're thinking. No, write down what you're thinking that's related to the question. Don't write down anything else that you're thinking about. Now, I said already that all of these drying methods are based on changing the position of the EMC, <laughs> equilibrium moisture content. So you just have to remember your wet solid is going to form a position of equilibrium with its surroundings and it, it wants to form that position of equilibrium. So if we artificially keep lowering the relative humidity of the air surrounding the sample, it will constantly be evaporating to try and get to that position of equilibrium. It's a bit like cheating the material to make it dry. Okay. We're going to look at four drying methods, and I said right at the start, two are appropriate for solids um, or semi-solids, as long as they're pretty dry, and two are appropriate for solutions and suspensions. Tray drying and fluidized bed drying are the methods for solids or semi-solids, and spray drying and freeze drying are the methods for suspensions and solutions. When I say semi-solids, uh, I think, do you remember the rheology lecture last year? Of course you do. It's about creams, isn't it? We talked about creams and things um, in that lecture. And I said the rheological properties are really important. You want to put a cream on, you don't want it to fall off and everything like that. And I said a cream is a semi-solid. That's not the sort of semi-solid that we're going to be drying because there's never going to be a situation where you make a cream, which is, a, say, a, um, an oil and water emulsion, and then dry it to remove the water. You know, it's, it, it is an oil and water emulsion and the water has to be there for it to be a cream. So when we say semi-solid, we're not talking about creams and things like that. We're talking about maybe a paste or a, a powder that's got quite a high water content. It, it's kind of flowable, but we're not talking about um, creams, just to be clear. So let's start first with tray drying. I'm going to start with tray drying for two reasons. One, it's the simplest. It's always best to start simple and get more complicated. And two, it's the method that you will have used or you should have used it. I don't know what's happening with the practicals in year two right now because of COVID. But nonetheless, if you've had a chance to go into the laboratory and you do the, uh, the practicals where you make tablets and capsules, then tray drying is one of the things that you do because you actually tray dry the material after it's been granulated. How does a tray dry work? I hear you ask. And the answer is uh, like the diagram on the screen in front of you. So what's going on? In simple terms, your material is put onto trays. That's where the name comes from, you see. So you put the material onto a tray, multiple trays, spread thinly. It's really important to spread the material thinly. I think you could imagine if you tried to dry a wet solid by having a huge, great powder, heap of powder, then what will happen is the surface will dry, but the material in the core is going to remain wet because it's never being exposed to the surrounding air. Remember the principle of drying here is to get exchange of water from the solid to the surrounding air. So therefore that material has got to be exposed to that air in order to dry. And if you create a really big pile of something, the surface area is really small. The key here is to try and increase the surface area of your material because that will make it dry faster. So spread the powder out onto the trays and you will create the highest surface area that you can. Those trays are then put into an oven and they can be put on top of each other, a bit like an oven that you might use in your kitchen at home. It's got multiple levels in, hasn't it? So you can put different trays at different heights. And then all that happens is air is passed over the sample with a fan. So air is pumped in at one end. It passes over the sample. As it enters the oven, the air is heated. And the reason it's heated is because of two reasons. 
that will heat up the oven. And so as the temperature of your um, sample increases, that will help drive the water off because you're giving the water more energy. And two, the capacity of air to hold water is also higher as it becomes um, hotter in temperature. So you're passing hot and turbulent air over the sample and that should encourage water to evaporate from the solid into that air. And it's really important that air is being passed over the sample and it goes out to an exhaust. So you never reach a position of equilibrium because the air is constantly being replaced. Right. Many years ago, in an exam answer, one of the students wrote what I consider to be the funniest exam answer I've ever read. So the exam question said, describe the principles of tray drying. And the answer I was looking for was, you pass hot, turbulent air over the sample. Not too difficult. The student wrote, you pass hot, flatulent air over the sample. Now, unless you're Joe Wicks, I don't think that's a good idea. So in an exam answer, when you're trying to describe tray drying, please remember you're passing hot, turbulent air over the sample, not hot, flatulent air. Um, I did consider trying that as an experiment in one of the undergraduate classes one day, but decided against it. So uh, that might be something you might want to consider trying in a research project at some point in the future. But please do that while I'm not in the building. What are the advantages and disadvantages of tray drying? <laughs> the number one advantage, and I think it might be the reason why we use it in the undergraduate classes, is it's cheap. <laughs> it's cheap. And so are we. And so cheap is, uh, cheap is cheerful, isn't it? So that's good. It's easy to use and it's reliable. You are literally just spreading your powder onto a tray and stick it into an oven. I think anyone could do that. It's uh, kind of useful. OK, so it's a very easy and cheap method to use. I should say at this point, I think you can imagine what's coming here, but all of the drying methods we're talking about are putting energy into a material to get it to dry. You have to add energy to get the material to dry. In this case, we're adding energy by increasing temperature and flowing air. So we're adding energy to the system. Anytime you're adding energy to a system, it's adding cost, isn't it? So if you're running one of these drying methods commercially, they all come with a cost. And some of them are more expensive than others. And so and I'm going to look at that in just a minute, actually. But in this particular instance, it, it's not a particularly efficient method of drying. You need to leave the material in the oven for upwards of a day in order to get it to dry properly. And the reason is because the material is granulated, but you've still got relatively large clumps. You're never going to spread the material out, and so it's a really fine powder on the surface of the tray because the material is wet. And I said already that dry powders will flow very well, but wet ones won't. So you're going to end up with big lumps on the on the tray, and therefore the surface area is not very high. It's as high as you can get it, but it's not very high. And so it takes up to 24 hours to dry, and that's not good um, commercially. And the other thing is that it doesn't take a large volume either. I think you can imagine that an oven's relatively small and you're manually putting out um, the, the powder on the tray. And so you can really only dry a small volume and it takes a long time. So commercially, that's not a good option, is it? I think you might imagine. So it's used on a small scale in a laboratory, maybe in a company if you're developing a small batch of something in pre-formulation. But commercially, for commercial batches, tray drying wouldn't really be used. So this is the start of my big table that I really think you should focus on. Uh, tray drying is the method of drying. It applies to a solid. You don't put a liquid onto a tray in the tray dryer. So it's got to be a solid. And really, it's a small mass of solid, maybe one to two kilos, nothing more than that. So if you see an example question and it says you need to dry a material, which is, say, wet granulated, and you've only got maybe one to two kilos of that material, which method of drying would you choose? you would say tray drying because it's a solid and it's a small mass, okay? Commercially, how do you dry wet solids? The answer is you use a technique called fluidized bed drying. So on the screen in front of you is a diagram that I managed to put together with PowerPoint showing you how a fluidized bed dryer works. And it works like this. So you take your powder, which is wet, and you put it into a really big kind of bowl or hopper which is the pink on the diagram. Underneath, at the bottom of the hopper, you've got small holes, and that allows air to enter the hopper. So the air comes in, it's heated, exactly the same as the tray dryer, actually. So hot air comes in under the sample. Okay. I think you can imagine that if you were trying to dry, say, 200 kilos of a powder, that's a lot of mass sitting at the bottom of the hopper. 
and the air is coming in underneath. If I had a really low powered pump, what's going to happen? The air is going to come underneath the powder and then the system will stop because the weight of the powder is going to stop the air coming up through that powder. So you need a really big pump and you've got to pump a lot of air underneath the mass of powder to the point where the powder starts to lift up. So you've got to generate enough air pressure to start to lift the powder bed you're trying to dry. And that can be on the hundreds of kilo scale. So it's kind of a lot of air pressure. But can you imagine that once that air pressure is there and it starts to lift up the powder bed, it's going to sort of disperse all of the particles that are in that powder bed because they're being lifted on a column of air. So what you're going to do is pass the air in the bottom of the fluidized bed dryer. It's going to lift the powder particles up and it's going to separate them and they're all going to move in a very turbulent way in this hot airflow. This means that the drying is very rapid. The reason is because as you lift up that powder bed and you separate all the particles, you create this really high surface area. And the particles become so small and they move around so fast, it's almost like a liquid. So the reason it's called fluidized bed drying is because when you've got the air pressure high enough to separate those particles, the bed is said to be fluidized and the material is moving around as fast as if it was a liquid so that the drying is really really fast now there's a couple of key points here one what happens if you don't put a lid on the hopper the answer is you get an awful lot of wet powder stuck on the ceiling of whichever facility you're using to dry the material because it's just going to blow the powder straight out and that's not good so you have to put a lid uh, on top of the hopper that's point number one what would happen if you didn't put holes in that lid the answer is you're pressurizing the chamber with a huge amount of hot air. It's going to explode, isn't it? So you're, if you don't create holes in the lid for the air to get out, you're, you're essentially creating a really big bomb. And that's also not good. So you need a lid to stop the powder being blown over your factory. But you need holes in that lid to let the air out. Otherwise, you run the risk of an explosion. So you have a filter on top of the hopper and that lets the air out. OK, so in principle, hot air is just dispersing all of your powder particles. Drying is very rapid because the surface area is um, very high. And so that's good from a commercial point of view. Rapid drying usually means efficient process, less cost. And so that's why it's used commercially. And of course, it can use large batches of material. So that's really good um, from a commercial perspective. Um, there are a couple of other benefits. Um, one is that because you, you're in control of the air that's passing in and the flow rate of that air, you get very good temperature control of the system. That just helps you keep a consistent product. And the other one, which you might not have thought about, is that because you've got all these particles moving around in the air, they're going to start hitting each other. And so they naturally knock any rough edges off of each other and they kind of smooth themselves. It's a bit like when you're trying to um, clean something up and you can put it into a uh, a sort of a bowl of rotating ball bearings. It seems surprising that a ball bearing can clean a material, but it will because it's just constantly knocking at the surface. And the same is true here. The powder particles are knocking each other and they become smooth. And if you're trying to flow that powder later on, that's a benefit, isn't it? It's dry, but it's also smooth. And so that it'll be like ball bearings. And so that's a good thing. I put under there, funny enough, you might say to me, hang on a minute, sir. Why does it say can smooth particles under both advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, I'm not going mad. The, the answer is that if you're then going to compact your materials, let's say you've wet granulated it to mix the active and the excipients, you've dried it, and now you're going to compact it, actually having really smooth round particles can be a negative because one of the ways that a tablet retains its strength once the powder has been compacted is because you've got irregular shaped particles and they kind of lock together. And so having really smooth particles can actually make uh, compaction harder so it can be an advantage or a disadvantage depending on what you're going to do with the material afterwards and the other one is I know I've said explosion already if you don't let the air out of the system there is another one which is a dust explosion I don't know if you've ever seen these but maybe type that into YouTube and see but think about a fire you need a fuel source oxygen and a spark so if you've got a material which is really, really dry because it's been through a dryer, it's kind of tinder dry. It's ready to it's ready to catch fire. 
if you then have the really fine particles going through the filter, so let's say the filter allows the air out, stops the big particles getting out, but it allows really small dust particles to come out, you can very quickly fill your factory with really fine dust, tinder dry dust. Oxygen, because it's in air, the only thing it needs is a spark. And there have been many, many instances where a factory is blown up because a dryer like this has allowed dust out into the main atmosphere and then someone turns on a light switch and the whole thing's gone. So there are some serious risks with fluidized bed drying. So this is our table again. Fluidized bed drying has now appeared. So it's the same deal. It's only going to work for a solid. You've got to be really careful with the name of this. It's fluidized bed doesn't mean it's applied to a fluid. It means that the bed of powder has become fluidized with the air. So it applies to solid. So if the question says you're drying a large mass of a solid, let's say it's been wet granulated, then you would choose fluidized bed drying. So just to be clear, if the materials are solid, you're going to use either tray drying or fluidized bed drying. And the choice that you make is on mass. Low mass, tray drying. High mass, fluidized bed drying. Right, spray drying. Spray drying is an interesting method and it's used commercially all the time for reasons I'm going to explain in a minute. My diagram is terrible, so the way this is going to work is you've got to imagine for your spray dryer that you have a liquid, it's a solution or a suspension, it's being fed into the spray dryer through a tube, that's the tube on the top right, and then you've got hot air coming into the system on the other side. So you've got a mixture of your solution or suspension and hot air coming in, and they both go through a small nozzle. So what happens is both the air and the liquid get to the nozzle and they both want to try and get through the nozzle at the same time. And the consequence of that is the liquid gets atomized into small droplets. It's the way that your car engine actually vaporizes fuel into the cylinders for combustion. It's turning liquid petrol or diesel into, um, into an aerosol by forcing it through a nozzle. So you create very small droplets of your solution. That's the red dots. And then the clever bit about um, spray drying is that underneath the nozzle, you have a hot air cyclone. So it's hot air again. So all these drying methods are the same. Hot air, but now it's spinning around and around like this. So what happens is the liquid is atomized through the nozzle. You get small droplets and they start to spin around and around in hot air. The water in the droplet starts to evaporate into the hot air and so the droplet starts to get smaller because the water is evaporating and anything which is dissolved in that water starts to crystallize out or maybe it becomes amorphous that's not a topic for today's lecture but just hold it in your mind and so you're going to end up with um, a much smaller but much more dense particle as the water is being evaporated because the cyclone is spinning around and around and around the more dense the particle becomes the more it's going to move to the outside of the chamber under centrifugal force. So the denser it becomes, the more it's going to move to the edge of the chamber. So what will happen is the liquid droplets start in the center and get spun around. The water is evaporating into the hot air, and so that's being exhausted to waste. And as your particles dry, they move to the edge of the chamber and they run down the side of the chamber and are collected at the bottom. It's kind of a clever setup. And it's really good commercially because it can run continuously. There's no limit to how much liquid you can put in at the top because you can always have a bucket underneath the spray dryer to collect your powder, remove the bucket and replace it with a new one. So it can operate continuously. And for that reason, it's, um, it's very widely used commercially. Moreover, it's extremely efficient method of drying because the droplets can be very small, maybe one or 200 microns in diameter. And so they dry really rapidly, one to two seconds. Each individual droplet has moved to the edge and out. It's a very rapid drying. I know I keep mentioning the crystalline and amorphous lecture that we talked about before, but uh, because this is really rapid drying, one to two seconds to go from in solution to a solid, it does have a propensity to make the material amorphous. So you can end up with glassy materials coming out of a spray dryer. I think I might have said in that lecture that spray drying is actually a way of making a material amorphous because of this rapid um, drying. You do have control over everything though, so you've got control over the air temperature and because it's very rapid drying you don't really raise the temperature of your material too much. So it's kind of good if your material is a little bit thermally labile, although freeze drying is better. I'll come on to that in just a second. 
you get very uniform particle sizes because as the liquid goes through the nozzle, each droplet which is produced is very uniform. And so your powders that are produced as a result of those droplets are also uh, extremely uniform. I've got a picture coming up in just a second. And that means it, um, it creates a very free flowing powder because it's spherical like the fluidized bed dryer. But also because the droplets are so small, the powder particles that come out can often be under 10 microns. And powders under 10 microns are absolutely ideal for breathing in. So it's a very common way of processing materials for dry powder inhalers because you end up with a, a particle size which is naturally the right size for inhalation. So quite a number of benefits of spray drying. There are some downsides, always downsides with any drying method. In this instance, cost. It's expensive to buy a spray dryer. It's large. You need a huge amount of air to pump through it and you can make the sample amorphous. So a few negatives, but in the main, this is the main method of drying used commercially for liquids. On the screen is an SEM, so that's scanning electron microscopy image of some spray dried particles. I hope you can see that um, the scale bar at the bottom, that's 10 microns. So that uh, white line shows you how long 10 microns is, it's very small. And you can see, I hope the particles are both small and round, which is what I just said. So ideal for inhalation. So spray drying, if the material is liquid, it's large in volume. And in particular, if it's for inhalation, spray drying is the method of choice. Last but not least is freeze drying. It's actually my favorite method of drying because it operates slightly differently from the other three that we've talked about. And the clue is in the name. Now, if you can't remember an exam situation, what is freeze drying? I can't remember. Uh, the first step in freeze drying is to freeze it. OK, really easy to remember. So the first thing we do is freeze the material in freeze drying. Then we place it under a vacuum. And I don't mean get the Dyson out of your mum's cupboard and place the sample underneath it. I mean under a vacuum where we, we move um, air. Uh, and then we reheat the sample. OK, it's kind of important. So what I said already was your sample is always surrounded by air and you're trying to you're trying to set up an equilibrium between the water content of your sample and air and the air. In this instance, there's no air because we've removed it are placing the material under vacuum. So the, the method of drying is slightly different, as we'll see in just a second. And it's based on the phase diagram of water. The phase diagram of water is shown on the screen. And I fully recognize that as soon as I say the words phase diagram, some of you are going to turn off. Some of you are going to sort of moan. Some of you might like the concept. So we're going to talk through it anyway. It's really important. The phase diagram for water looks like the red lines on this graph kind of a weird looking thing, right? On the y-axis is pressure, atmospheric pressure, or pressure of the air surrounding the sample. Anyway. And on the um, x-axis is temperature. If we start on the y-axis at um, the line that says 10 to the 5 on the top left of that figure, 10 to the 5 pascals is atmospheric pressure. So that's the normal air pressure around you. If you then moved across the line, starting on the left hand side, and you just move to the right as the temperature increases. What this says is water at low temperature at atmospheric pressure exists as a solid. Ice, in fact. When it gets to a particular temperature, zero degrees centigrade, it turns to a liquid because the material melts and becomes water. And when it gets to 100 degrees centigrade, it vaporizes to form a gas or steam. OK, so you should know that. So. Really, the diagram is simply telling you what you already know, atmospheric pressure. It just says water turns from a solid to a liquid at zero degrees centigrade and from a liquid to a gas at 100 degrees centigrade. I hope you know that. What you might not know is that as you reduce the pressure, so as you reduce the atmospheric pressure, the melting point and the boiling point of water change. This is true for all materials, not just water. So you can create these phase diagrams by measuring the boiling point and the melting point as a function of pressure. And if you do that, you'll end up with a diagram like this. And this is the one for water. Water is unusual in that at one particular critical point, the three phases come together. Because it's such a critical point, I've put it onto the graph. It's at 610 pascals and 0 0.0075 degrees centigrade. And it's called a triple point. A triple point because all three phases exist at the same uh, at the same time, at that particular combination of pressure and temperature. It's kind of unusual. But it's really important because we need to focus on what happens at pressures below 610 um, pascals. 
If you look at the diagram below 610 pascals, I hope you can see that on the left hand side, water is a solid, ice, as it is at room temperature, uh, room atmospheric pressure. Uh, but as it heats up, there's no liquid phase. The liquid phase has disappeared. So the material will go from a solid directly to a gas. So I'm sure you know what that's called. It's called subliming. The material will sublime. And so any material that sublimes, if you look at its phase diagram, it will have a triple point like this. It must have a triple point because the liquid phase has to disappear so that you go directly from a solid to a liquid. There are very few liquids that I'm aware of, or liquids at room um, temperature and pressure, so what we would perceive as a liquid in normal use solvent, that have a triple point. Water is one, which is why it's um, commonly used for freeze drying. And there is another one, tertiary butanol is also used for freeze drying. But otherwise, there's very few um, useful organic solvents that have a triple point. And so freeze drying can only be applied to a material that has a triple point. So you can freeze dry with water and you can freeze dry with tertiary butanol, but otherwise it's uh, a bit tricky. How does freeze drying actually work? So um, we need to follow the four numbers that are on the diagram. One, two, three, four. So I'll talk you through it at point one. That's where we load the material to be dried into the freeze dryer. Your material is going to be a solution or a suspension. OK, so normally we load at, say, 25 degrees centigrade or room temperature and atmospheric pressure. So that would be point number one on the graph. And I said already, the first thing that happens with a freeze dryer is we freeze. OK, so freezing, but keeping the pressure the same is the same as moving from point number one to point number two. So still atmospheric pressure, but the temperature has reduced. And we need to reduce the temperature below zero so that the water freezes. OK, so point number one to point number two. Then we place the material under vacuum while it is frozen. So that has the effect of uh, moving from point number two to point number three. The pressure is reduced, but the material is still kept frozen. So we go from point number two to point number three. It's critical that the pressure is reduced to below 610 pascals because we must be below the triple point. So we have to pull a vacuum on the material which is uh, under 610 pascals. OK, so we're at point number three. And then the last stage of freeze drying is to reheat the sample. You can go back to room temperature, so three to four on the diagram. But importantly, the heating is done under vacuum. OK, so we're not just letting the air back in and reheating the sample. We are reheating the sample under vacuum. And that has the consequence of moving us from point number three to point number four on the diagram. And I hope you can see if you're following from what I'm saying, that will cause the water to sublime. In other words, it goes directly from a solid to a liquid. This is kind of important. If you think about the advantages of freeze drying, at no point has the temperature of the material increased from room temperature, has it? It started at room temperature, it went down and it went back to room temperature. We have achieved drying without actually increasing the temperature of the material. And that's really clever. And so it's really good for thermally labile materials. Thermally labile meaning those that are going to degrade at, say, 30 or 40 degrees centigrade. Things like proteins. Um, really good because you're not really increasing the temperature. Secondly, it makes a really porous material. It makes a porous material because when you froze it, you've got solute molecules dispersed in water and you freeze it. So you've got pockets of water and, and some solute molecules. And then when you remove that water by sublimation, you end up with void spaces where the water um, was. So if I show you a picture of that, um, it looks like on the screen, you can see this is SEM again. Dark spaces are where the water was. So you end up with an extremely porous material with um, lots of holes in it and a very high surface area. And that's really important when we think about the applications of freeze drying. Disadvantages are it's really expensive. It costs a lot of energy to pull a vacuum and dry a material this way. And it's slow and really only operates for small volumes. OK. So that means that freeze drying and spray drying applies to liquids only. So if I show you a, a set of materials to dry and they're liquid, you're going to pick spray drying or freeze drying. 
It's a little bit harder to choose between the two. You've got to think a little bit more carefully now. Large volumes of material tend to be spray dried because it can operate continuously and it's cheap. You can dry large volumes in a freeze dryer. It's used commercially. So you can dry large volumes, but it's extremely expensive. <laughs> so if you could spray dry, you would. So really, if it's a liquid and it's a large volume, you're going to use spray drying. And there may be an additional thing, say, if it's for inhalation, then spray drying makes really good particles for inhalation. On the other hand, freeze drying is important. It's especially important for materials that are going to degrade um, uh, with temperature, so proteins and things like that. And the other one, which is kind of important, and I don't think, um, I don't think we've talked about it much, is if you've got a material which is designed to be given by injection, so let's think about uh, penicillin or something like that, and you and you want to have um, a small vial for injection. So that would be a little glass vial filled with a solution of um, penicillin. So when you go to have that administered, the nurse will pull the, the solution into the syringe and inject it. That is really difficult to formulate for some materials if they are unstable in water. So I mentioned hydrolysis already. So if a material hydrolyzes in water, you can't make a solution of it and keep it for years and years and years because it will degrade in solution. Penicillins are really bad. So penicillins will degrade in one or two days in water. So you can't formulate a solution of penicillin that way because there won't be any penicillin left in it by the time you want to administer it to a patient. So quite often when you look at um, vials that are for inhalation, you'll see they're a powdered material and you have another vial next to it, which is a reconstitution solution. And this is definitely true for penicillins and many other things. And so what will happen is that um, penicillin solution will have been freeze dried in that vial and it creates a dry, so stable on storage, but amorphous powder with a really high surface area. So what that means is when the nurse is going to administer the benzyl pen or any penicillin, benzyl penicillin is a good one, you're going to take the reconstitution solution, you're going to draw it up into a syringe, you're going to add it to this vial with the freeze-dried powder. It's going to dissolve really, really fast because it's amorphous and it's got a high surface area. So this should dissolve really, really fast. If you're only having a few seconds between adding the solution and then administering this to the patient, you do not need any particles in this solution. It's really important not to inject something that's got um, particles in it because it can block capillaries. It's really serious. So if you're going to re-dissolve something like this, it needs to dissolve absolutely, completely uh, and really fast. And so the way that's done is by freeze drying because it makes powders that are amorphous and high surface area. If you're American, and they, they don't use the word freeze drying. They use the word lyophilized. I don't understand where that comes from. So sometimes you might see the words lyophilized powder. Well, that just simply means freeze dried. OK, there are some other um, areas in which you might use freeze drying. One I mentioned again at the start, which was uh, probiotic bacteria. So quite often you don't want um, you don't want to give a probiotic suspension or something as a liquid. You might want to make it as a tablet. It's a little bit more convenient for the patient. And so you can't put um, a bacterium that contains like 90 percent water into a tablet and expect it to be OK. So you would actually create a suspension of bacteria in a little vial again, freeze dry it and actually pull the water out of the bacteria. It sounds completely implausible, doesn't it, that a bacterium could survive being freeze dry, <laughs> but it can. So you, you would create a really dry shell of a bacterium and then when you add it to water the bacterium will reabsorb that water and it recovers its viabilities kind of amazing but it's also uh, true <laughs> so you can freeze dry um, bacteria and the other one is that there is one particular product which is made which is made by freeze drying and it's made by freeze drying specifically to give it the properties that it needs and that's on the screen it's Nurofen Meltlets so there are other fast melt types actually <laughs> I always pick Nurofen because I like ibuprofen but there are other ones but um, so I don't know if you've ever tried one of these so the, the principle of a meltlet tablet is that you don't need to walk around with water so imagine that you had a, a bag of headache not a bag a box of headache tablets in your bag and you were out somewhere in the middle of let's say you're in the middle of the desert and you get a bit de dehydrated and you had a headache and stuff and you thought, I know, I'll take one of those Nurofen tablets that's in my bag. And then you think, well, I won't, will I? Because I haven't got any water to swallow it with. That's the reason you're in that predicament in the first place. The point about the Meltlet tablets is that they have um, 
a really porous and amorphous structure. So when you put them on your tongue, the water that's in your mouth is sufficient to dissolve them. No need to carry around any additional water. You, you're using the saliva that's in your mouth to dissolve the tablets. It's kind of like a marketing advantage. They're sold on the grounds of no need for water because you don't need to swallow them with water. And the reason that they work is simply because they are made by freeze drying. So it, it is um, a solution of ibuprofen with a few other things, glycerol and a few other ingredients in there, mannitol, I think. And you pour that into a blister pack and then you freeze dry directly in the blister pack. And you end up with a tablet, which is the same shape as the blister because it was freeze dried in the blister pack. But it's got the same structure I just showed you for um, any freeze dried powder, amorphous and really high surface area. It's one of the reasons why you've got to be a bit careful handling um, meltlet tablets actually because as you try and push them through the foil you can actually crush them because they don't have a lot of mechanical strength because they've got so many void spaces in yeah right what does that mean it means we're at the end hurrah so on the screen is my summary slide of the things that you need to remember the first thing is that the water content of your material is always going to be in equilibrium with its surroundings the point of most of maybe not the freeze drying but the other drying methods is that we try and keep the relative humidity of the air surrounding the sample low because that forces the material to lose water and to dry out. Uh, it's really important <laughs> to remember that you can dry a material to any dryness that you want, including bone dry, but we don't normally go that far. It costs too much and also it disrupts the physical properties of the material. But you also need to remember what is the relative humidity of the storage conditions for my material? Because if you dry the material too far, it's going to re-wet on storage. And so you've just wasted energy and time drying a material when it's going to re-wet anyway. So understanding the equilibrium moisture content of your material under storage conditions is kind of key because it tells you where you need to get to in your drying method. If a material is drying by convective drying, so to be clear, Tray drying, fluidized bed drying, and spray drying are all drying with convective drying. There are four stages of convective drying. The first region is linear, and it's water evaporating from the surface. The second and third regions are non-linear. The first non-linear region, water is still evaporating from the surface, but it's being replaced by water from capillaries. And in the second um, non-linear region, the water is evaporating from the capillaries. So in all cases, the surface area is constantly reducing, and so the rate is slowing. And in region four, the material is at its equilibrium moisture content, and so no further water loss occurs. When you are asked to work out which method of drying you should use for a particular sample, solids are dried with tray drying or sprayed, uh, oh, <laughs> I'm doing it now, tray drying or fluidized bed drying. The only difference between those two is the mass of the sample. Small mass, tray drying, large mass, fluidized bed drying. Just try and remember some of the advantages and disadvantages, because when you have to justify why you've done that, you know, you can also add some things like, well, if it's a large volume of material, I'd use fluidized bed drying because it's appropriate for large volumes, but also it's very economical and it smooths the powders and things like that, okay? If the material is a liquid, it's a solution or a suspension, it's going to be either spray drying or freeze drying, and again, it really does come down to volume. You're going to use large volumes in a spray dryer and typically small volumes in a, in a freeze dryer. But spray drying has the advantage of making particles that are perfect for inhalation. Whereas freeze drying is much better for materials that are thermolabile or those materials that might hydrolyze in solution or those materials that are being made to uh, dissolve very rapidly. OK, so with that, we're done. If you have any questions, fire me an email. Otherwise, I'll see you soon.